Hi, welcome to the noise pad. What you're looking at are a pair of helium cadmium lasers. Now there's a reason why there are two of them. I'll get to that in a second. I really like non-solid state lasers. There's so much beautiful physics that goes into their construction. And it's always amazing that human beings have figured out how to build these things in any practical way that could be mass manufactured. And there's so many cool things happening inside a laser head like this. So I originally had this one, which was a dumpster find initially, but it wasn't working and it was doing some really unusual but rather beautiful things when it was turned on and eventually completely died. I finally figured out what was wrong with it, but unfortunately it's not recoverable. So I went on eBay and I found another one. These things are not in high demand because obviously of their size and power consumption and so on, but they do produce really nice laser coming out. And this one was sold at this and luckily it works because I already had the power supply that was functional. This just came as a laser head by itself. As you will see, the power supply itself is a work of art and is quite rare to find. So we're going to talk about this construction, how it works, what the physics behind it is, and how does a helium cadmium laser even produce the kind of wavelengths it does. And then there's a couple of experiments that I can do on this that goes in the heart of how they work. Now this is part of another video that I'm working on, probably one of my most favorite videos I've ever made on the channel. It's going to take a little bit longer until that is ready, but in the meanwhile, I can at least show you a couple of things about these lasers. So let's go. Now, as with any laser, the material that you use and the size of the cavity is going to determine the kind of wavelength you support for coherent laser production. Now, in this case, we're using cadmium and helium, and there's a reason for that. If we were to only use helium and make a helium laser, we're going to get wavelengths in the 632 nanometer or so, which is depending on the helium atomic structure, its electron orbits and so on. So when you excite the helium atom, when it returns into a neutral state, you're going to get photons back, and you can create coherent light out of that. That's just a fundamental a laser production that's how it works but cadmium is a solid so obviously you cannot use it as it is you have to heat it up and turn it into a gas but at the same time exciting cadmium to produce laser light coming out of it is hard on its own so by mixing it with the helium a couple of things happen first the heliums get excited first and they're going to create emission that's going to ca cause a cascade event and that cascade event is going to excite the cadmiums helium also allows you to move the atoms of cadmium in vapor form around the chamber and stabilize it it's a pretty complex structure but it works really nicely the amount of helium in a helium cadmium laser is only about a few percent of the total volume of the laser compared to the cadmium. So it's not a lot, but it's enough to essentially get it started. Now in this situation, cadmium reservoir is right here underneath this, and there's a heater in here that needs to heat up the cadmium to about 250 degrees Celsius, which starts to evaporate. It's a few millitors of pressure inside of the laser cavity. Now the size of the laser is obviously important. Cadmium on its own can give you two wavelengths, something around 441 nanometer and 325 nanometer or so. Those numbers are roughly correct. And those numbers would be extremely accurate and very repeatable because they depend on the physical nature of the atoms. They cannot produce any other wavelength because that's what the cadmium molecular structure is. And that's where there's electron orbit energy levels are. So that's why this is going to produce a particular wavelength. Now this is tuned for the 441 or 2 nanometer or so. So we're going to have to measure that to make sure it is doing that. Now the very far back, you can see the high voltage cable going in. And this is the anode meter, which is sitting at thousands of volts. So it's quite deadly when it's open like this. When it's running, you have to be very, very careful with it. Now working on lasers is dangerous in multiple ways. First of all, you got the line lethal voltages, then you got the high voltage, and then you have the laser emissions, which can come from anywhere if you're not careful. So please do not take these lightly. You have to know what you're doing in order to work on these devices. And then I said, there is the, the capillary here, there's the confinement point for the cadmium there. There's the cadmium reservoir. That's where the cadmium is going to be heated up and melted. And you can see a rod right through here, and the end of the rod is there, and that's the main discharge capillary of the laser. Now, if you move further down, somewhere in there, there's a temperature sensor. Let me see if I tilt it, if you can see it. There's a diode somewhere on this. I can't see it right now, but there's a diode that measures the temperature of this entire tube. And if it starts to overheating, it's going to have to shut it down. There needs to be a constant airflow as the plasma gets really, really hot. And obviously, these heaters get really hot. And you have to keep that under control. And then, going further down here, which is the cool end of the laser, that's actually where the laser emission is in the center, comes out of from the other side. We have the helium reservoir. There's a closed loop system inside of this laser that monitors the pressure and from that it can estimate how much helium is in the chamber and it's going to adjust that by allowing helium to flow back and forth from this high pressure reservoir and there's a valve in there that is controlled i think it's controlled thermally it allows the helium to go in and then mix and have the exact right amount of pressure really sophisticated from a physics point of view 
Now, I found out what the problem with the other one is. There are two uh, fi filaments in here, and these are the cathode connections. And those cathode connections, there's a main one and a spare one. And unfortunately, both of those seem to have been dead in, the, in this laser that I'm pointing to right now. The other one seems to have both of them intact. So we'll measure that and we'll see. And then finally, at the end, the cathode mirror is on the other side. And the laser obviously happens along the length of this. Now, when you turn these lasers on from the tube itself, you're going to observe non-coherent light. But that non-coherent light is not just at one wavelength, which is the coolest part of the laser, because you can see all the atomic structures and the material compositions by observing the light com coming out of the laser cavity chamber itself. It's really, really fascinating. And there are some indications of how much manual work goes into tuning and aligning these lasers. There are very powerful magnets that are glued in some strategic places, and they're obviously glued after they've been adjusted. There's another one right here at the very end. And they, they basically align the plasma. So by putting a strong magnetic field, you can shift and tune the plasma to point in a certain direction. I think that's what they're doing with these ones. The other laser also has them, but they're in different places. So there's some variability inside of these tubes and the way the plasma is formed and so on. I think that's how they're tuning and aligning them, which is pretty cool itself. There is one other thing that happens in these lasers. There is a button at the far end, over here, this button actually right around here, and this is called cadmium melt. And what happens is that in some situation, if the laser especially is turned off prematurely because there's a very precise shutdown sequence you have to follow to turn these lasers on and off, otherwise you can damage them. And what happens is that if you, let's say somebody pulls the plug or emergency turns off the laser, there is cadmium vapor in the entire chamber. And that's going to very quickly deposit, perhaps in places it's not supposed to, like on the mirrors. In that situation, you can turn on the cadmium melt and it heats up everything to a very high temperature, trying to melt and evaporate the cadmium in places it's not meant to be and to release it back into the chamber. And that's generally not very good for the laser. It's a kind of a last resort uh, to melt the cadmium. But that's essentially what it is. And I think that's what this relay is actually controlling. You can see, looking at the side view there, you can see the over here from the helium reservoir going into the main cavity there. Really cool stuff. Look how much work that's been gone into just putting this together. There's also a one mega ohm resistor here. This one mega ohm resistor is the feedback path of the high voltage power supply. That's how it manages to measure to make sure the high voltage power supply is present. Now something happens to these lasers when the cathode filaments are dead on this one. It's actually quite dangerous. What happens is that the power supply basically goes haywire and thousands of volts above the rated voltage appears at the end of the mirror. And you can even hear the crackling noise of the high voltage power supply when these filaments are dead. That's how I originally found out that this is happening. But I'll show you the measurement on the other, other one too. And here's the power supply and just look at the work of art, the amount of passion that's gone into just the wiring of this thing and all the zip ties to keep everything under control. There is a cover over here that manages the thermal airflow over these heat sinks, and these heat sinks are sitting at live voltages, so very dangerous, and some big power resistors obviously here that need to be cooled. The fan is right over here. And look at all the fuses and all of them labeled. Ah, just beautiful. Now the job of this power supply is a few things. Obviously it needs to provide a high voltage to the laser head, and those are done in these potted components over here, and it also is supposed to po provide power to all the filaments, and those are at low voltages. It needs to have several timers to, to go through the shutdown and the power on sequence. And it also has to have multiple closed loop systems for the cadmium and the helium reservoirs. And all of that is basically handled over these few PCBs. There is a full bleach rectifier, which then goes into these big two capacitors with discharge resistors on them, which is not surprising. And the rest of it is essentially analog circuitry controlled. I don't think there's any, even a microcontroller in, in any of this. It's all just done with classic design. It's really quite beautiful. And the knobs in the front, is it goes through the different states. And there's a key in here, which I think I should be able to take out if I turn the laser off. And that's the key. And this key allows you to shut the laser down in an emergency without going through the shutdown procedure. And that's what causes that cadmium buildup on the mirrors that you don't want. So you really have to use this only in an emergency situation. Otherwise, you will either lower the lifetime of the laser or damage it in some way. All the connections to the laser are proprietary. Even the power line coming in is proprietary. There's a big filter over here. AC comes over here. Control is here. High voltage is here. Not surprising with the thick wires that you see going over there. You just connect it up and turn it on. So here's the front of the power supply, just so you can see what I was talking about. Here's the emergency shutdown. Then we have the shutdown operate and standby, which is only what should be used to bring the laser up and down. We have the cadmium heater, the helium heater, temperature lockout for over, temperature, and of course, the power of this. That's really all there is in the front.
And in the back, we have the three connectors that I was mentioning that are proprietary. The high voltage one is recessed, as you can see, so you couldn't accidentally touch it, at least protect you to some degree. The fan, and I think this is for some remote interlock or remote control, which this particular supply doesn't have. So in the back of the laser, we have the two connections. Here's a cadmium heater that I was talking about that you should typically never use. And there's a couple of measurement points in here labeled VR, VT, and the blue and the black one. And from this, you can measure the actual power supply high voltage that's arriving at the laser, as well as measuring the current in the filaments and a few other parameters. And we're going to measure those to make sure that they're correct. There's two potentiometers, which is a VR and a VT, which is the filament current and the high voltage power supply. They can be adjusted. Typically, you don't want to touch that in the lifetime of the laser. Unfortunately, the label is gone, so someone must have filled with them at some point. So we're going to have to make sure that they are within reasonable range. And here's the front of the laser. You can open and close the aperture using this. There's an LED that tells you the laser emission on. And there's an hours counter here. And these things power on, even remain on for years if you haven't used the laser. So this one seems to have 836.7 hours of operation, which I actually don't think is a lot for a particular laser, but nonetheless, that's what it says on there. Okay, so let's measure the filaments of the bad laser to make sure that they really aren't there. So here's the negative of the filament. So here's the spare. And you can see there's absolutely nothing. We're looking for something less than 2 ohms. So there's nothing there. And on the primary, that's 93 ohm. That's not from the filament. That's from the rest of the circuitry connected to that active filament. Now, if you go on the good laser's head and measure the spare on that one, here is the spare. Look at that. That's exactly what we want. And the one that's in circuit, there it is. So yeah, indeed, both of the filaments on the other head are good, which I'm quite happy about. And this one, unfortunately, is not repairable. These filaments are inside the cavity of the laser, so there's not much I can do about it. But now we should be able to bring this up and make sure it's operating. Okay, so all the cables are now connected, as you can see, our proprietary stuff. And I also have put a couple of fans on top of the tube because I want to run it without the top cover so we can see the actual incoherent light coming from the tube itself. But then I need this fan to keep it at some reasonable temperature. Otherwise, it's going to go into a thermal runaway very quickly and it will shut down, essentially. So first, we're going to turn this on some blowing air and I'm going to switch it into operate fingers crossed all right operate so the fan is on oh look at that wow that is that is super beautiful the colors on the camera don't do it justice so this is obviously not blue we're expecting blue but that's the incoherent light coming from the chat uh, from the cavity itself and we're going to measure that there's a lot of cool information embedded in there still no laser coming out it's going to take about a few minutes before we stabilize this. Let's come back after a few minutes. So the color is slowly changing and you can see the mirror finish right there. My hand is quite far from it. The mirror finish has cadmium buildup on the inside of the wall that looks like a mirror from the outside of the tube there. Let's keep waiting. So no laser emissions yet. And you can see a tiny bit of spot forming right there, but it's very dim and it's not in the right wavelength yet. You have to keep waiting. It's only been about a minute. And it's been running for some time, and check it out. That is a beautiful blue light. I can kind of feel it on the palm of my hand. This is not a very powerful laser. I am wearing goggles, by the way, just so you know. But it is very nice. So it is definitely working. So let's do some measurement on it. By the way, in case you're wondering, these are the goggles that I'm wearing. And if you look at this, if this is in focus here, between the wavelengths of 190 to 520, we have an optical density of greater than 9. So these pair of goggles will attenuate wavelengths in these frequencies by a factor of 10 to the 9, which is a lot. So through these goggles, which are of course are going to look orange, if you look at the beam, you can see a very faint dot. And that's basically what I see. I'm not looking at it anymore, obviously. But yeah, that's what I would see when I look at it. You've got to be careful in these situations. And the laser cavity has now stabilized and the color has, I think, settled to where it's going to be. So I want to measure the wavelength coming out of here. So I want to look at the spectral content of this the spectral content at the end over there, and of course the spectral content of the laser itself. So let's measure some of these voltages for the health of the laser and see what we're dealing with. So first the helium pressure regulator set point, which for this laser should be, it's written up here actually, it should be about 7.62, this is 7.92, it's a little bit higher, we could lower it potentially. And here's the high voltage power supply, 1.6 kilovolts, 1.7 kilovolts, it should be around that. Yeah, that's pretty close, it should be 1.7. And the plasma discharge current, 100 milliamp or so, it's about correct as well. It says that it should be 9 0.987. So I think the health of the laser is reasonable, and hopefully we can now do some more measurements.
So how do I know the white light coming from the laser cavity isn't just any ordinary white light? Well, we can very quickly observe that before we even do any spectral measurement. So if you look at this diffraction mirror, you're looking at the lights in my ceiling, which are LED lights. Now these produce a really broad spectrum of light that combine to make it look like white from the ceiling. And the spectrum is white, it's continuous, there's a lot of different colors, there's no individual unique peaks in it. It has to do with the semiconductor composition and the various effects that happen with the fluorescence of the white light and so on, which we can talk about in a different video. But we can do the same experiment with the white laser cavity light and see if it looks the same. And if you look at that, look, there are very distinct colors that you see reflecting off. And that tells us that this spectrum has very unique peaks in it, according to the material that's, of course, the cavity is made of and the size of the cavity. That's already an indication that this is no ordinary white light. Now we should measure the spectrum. So here's our setup for measuring the spectrum of the laser. We're going to use this spectrometer. I'm going to talk about this in a totally different video. There's a lot of interesting things about this. But I'm just reflecting laser off of some surface over here. Obviously not pointing it directly into the spectrometer input. Otherwise, we will surely damage it. And then we can look at the exact line coming out. And here's the output spectrum. And it is at 436 nanometer or so, which is what we were expecting. But I have noticed that the laser power is slowly drifting up and down in a periodic way. You can see it's going down again. And I think there is an issue with the power supply adjustment. We can fix that later in a separate video. Right now we're just interested in seeing the actual spectral line. So now it's at its lowest point, it's going to go back up again. So look how pure the spectrum is. There's only one light coming out. There's obviously ambient light in the room, but it doesn't really matter because the signal is so much stronger for the dynamic range that we're looking at. But I want to look at the cavity now. The cavity should have many more lines in it, as we saw using the diffraction mirror. And because there is helium presence and there will be non-coherent excitation of the helium atoms, which are required for the excitation of the cadmium to begin with, so we should see a whole bunch of lines associated with helium. And here we are, our probe pointing directly into the cavity now. Let's look at the spectrum. And here's the spectrum of the cavity. Look how cool that is, all the different lines that helium represents. I think this is the most famous one, I should say, the most common one, at around 582 nanometers or so. And there's one at green that's also present there. And a couple of other ones extending all the way to infrared and even in the ultraviolet region. But you don't see the spectrum of the laser in here very well at all, because that's the coherent mode. That's the mode that the laser is trying to preserve, putting out of the front main mirror there. So all these lines are there, and there's so much information that can be extracted by looking at this. That's one way we actually know what stars are made of, by looking at the emissions they produce because they are atomically related. It's very cool to see this. And I've set the laser to shut down, and it's slowly shutting down by making sure that the cadmium deposits in the right places. You can see the main tone of the helium is still present because the cavity is still energized, and the plasma is there. Some of the other tones are slowly going down, and eventually this will also disappear when the high voltage power supply completely turns off and the cavity silences. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this video. The Signal Path really is a science channel. I'm trying to cover all kinds of topics, whatever that is interesting, not just microwave engineering. The fun is in understanding the science in general. Let me know what you think in the comment section. I'll try and do some work on the power supply and find out why the power of the laser was fluctuating. There's some instructions on what to check, but I think it should be repairable if the tube itself is functional, which I think it is. As always, I'll see you next time.